go. Okay. The other thing I'm going to do, as I customarily do when we learn together on Zoom on Thursday mornings, is start out by putting everyone on mute. Um, you may still unmute yourself um, just by pressing the unmute button, uh, or if you're on the phone, I, I haven't said that in a while, but I believe it's star six to unmute yourself. Uh, we have a um, impossibly enormous task over the next uh, 45 plus minutes. Um, and it's, it's, it's just truly staggering to try to even scratch the surface of Professor Eliezer Berkowitz's um, philosophy and thought and theology. So we, we're not going to attempt to do that, but we are going to attempt to scratch the surface of his philosophy of halacha. We're going to do so in two ways, by reading some excerpts uh, from uh, Professor David Chazoni's introduction to a collection of essays which he edited in which he attempts to get a little bit of a handle on uh, Rabbi Dr. Eliezer Berkowitz's philosophy of halacha um, and in a couple of the little sections which I think are so salient and powerful for our consideration um, in in Professor Berkowitz's own words um, we'll look at a couple excerpts from one of his essays law and morality and Jewish tradition <clears throat> while this is not <clears throat> excuse me, precisely a companion class to the one which will follow. I think it'll be fascinating to, uh, for those who are able to join again next Thursday, we'll be looking at a um, current scholar of, of theology and halacha, really in the contemporary contemporary moment, uh, Dr. Ronit Irshai, who I had the privilege to meet a couple of times um, uh, through Shira's affiliation uh, in recent years with the Hartman Institute. Um, and she is really a, a keen uh, and extraordinary thinker. And I'll be pulling some excerpts from some of her writing um, around the notion of Akedah theology, uh, really a different kind of theology of halacha, of subservience, um, which while of course, Professor Eliezer Berkowitz talks a lot about obligation, um, I think he has a different balance between obligation and autonomy, between obligation and uh, flexibility of interpretation, creativity of interpretation, um, than uh, Dr. Onit Irshai posits is the current state of modern Orthodox halakha and philosophy of halakha. I think Dr. Berkowitz would agree. And as we'll see in the intro, part of why um, you know, there's been an encouragement by some to a, a revisiting of his thought is because of a sense that that's needed in our modern Orthodox community today. I'll share one other kind of two other personal notes or anecdotes, um, one mine and one from a couple of other members of the Bayi. Um, and I was trying to see if I have this, if this is uh, accurate history or just um, colored by memory. But I believe that my first discovery of Professor Eliezer Berkowitz's writing was in my, my gap year, before it was called a gap year, my Shana Ba'aretz, uh, learning in Yeshiva Haratzion in 98, 99. In addition to spending as many hours as I could in the Beit Midrash, I also spent time in the library. The yeshiva had you know, some artificial division between Beit Midrash and library. Um, and the library contained incredible volumes of not just kind of classic um, you know, Sfarim, uh, books of Jewish law and, and commentary, um, but also Jewish philosophy and scholarship of different kinds. And I really enjoyed, you know, um, wandering through the stacks of the Yeshiva Haaretzion Library. And I don't know what brought me to uh, a volume called Not in Heaven by Professor Eliezer Berkowitz, but it, it, I read it very, very carefully at that time. And it deeply shaped my thinking about halacha and philosophy of halacha. Um, I took a lot of notes uh, and underlined a lot in my copy, not the library's copy, I got my own copy. And um, it's definitely influenced my thinking, and but I have not returned to his writings for a long time. So when we decided to do a summer series on Jewish thinkers, I was excited for the opportunity to return to some of his thought and share, again, just a few snippets um, with you. For those who are interested in more, um, he wrote 19 books, and you can get many of them easily online. If you'd like a copy of the um, intro to this uh, set of essays of Professor Berkowitz's and the first essay, that is to say the text we're going to be drawing from, you can email me or Shuli and we'll send you a, a PDF 
um, a scan of those texts that we're going to be looking at this morning. Um, two, um, both Professor Stephen Baim and Hillel Jaffe uh, informed me, seeing the poster, that the Ba'i did actually host Professor Eliezer Berkowitz many years ago for a scholar in residence. I don't know whether anybody who's on the Zoom now was in the Ba'i at that time. Both of them described, oh, so you were there, amazing. Um, I, well, I welcome your thoughts. Um, both uh, Steve Baim and Hillel described it as for them amongst the most impactful um, scholar in residence, Shabbatonim, uh, in terms of content and the power of his delivery and his persona. So I see Tzvi nodding. Feel free if you want to unmute and share anything from, uh, from that, um, that Shabbat, but it, I'm, I'm delighted that the Ba'i welcomed him. Sorry, I wasn't there at that time. And um, and delighted to be able to share with all of you a little bit of his uh, his thought. So um, it'll be a little bit frontal today. Um, I'll pause at a couple of points for uh, feedback. But I, I want to, uh, after being a little late and a lengthy introduction, I want to give both Professor Chazoni's analysis and Professor Berkowitz's word words pride of place. So uh, bear with me as we do that. Just adjust things here a little bit and enlarge. Okay. I also, with your permission, I'm going to do the reading because I think it'll enable me to sort of skim read and explain uh, as we go. So this is from Professor Chazoni's introduction to this volume um, called Essential Essays on Judaism. Uh, Professor Berkowitz's essays. I actually want to read to you the titles so you get a flavor for um, what his writing covers. Law and Morality in Jewish Tradition, that's what we're going to read some excerpts from. The Nature and Function of Jewish Law, Conversion and the Decline of the Oral Law, A Jewish Sexual Ethics, The Biblical Idea of Justice, those are all under the heading Jewish Morality and Law. Under the heading Jewish Nationhood, we have On the Return to Jewish National Life, for Professor Berkowitz, the state of Israel was a, a, a cornerstone of his understanding of where halacha and Jewish uh, peoplehood um, was and needed to go. And the opportunities that Medinat Israel provides uh, were you know, incomparable and extraordinary um, for the Jewish people going forward. On Jewish sovereignty, towards a renewed rabbinic leadership, and the spiritual crisis in Israel. So you can see both uh, a true optimism, but also a clear-eyed acknowledgement of where he saw problems um, in Jewish life. And finally, in section three, Jewish theology, the encounter with the divine, knowledge of the world and knowledge of God, the concept of holiness, and faith after the Holocaust, to which he devoted at least one complete um, book. Uh, so you see, uh, comprehensive thinker, uh, deep thinker, and again, someone who was really engaged with the modern moment and, and saw a need for renewed or revisited uh, perspectives in Jewish philosophy and Jewish thought on the, on the issues of the day. Um, I hope uh, when we get to his writings, you'll find them to be accessible even, even as they are you know, clearly from someone who's deeply learned and incredibly well read in philosophy and Jewish texts. Um, so uh, here we go. In the, in, the, in the very beginning of the introduction, uh, Professor Chazoni argues for why he feels, as we've touched on, um, Professor Berkowitz's writings are, are especially critical in a moment like ours. This, this uh, collection of essays was published in 2001. Uh, Professor Berkowitz died, I believe, in 1992. Um, so a decade posthumously, this, this collection of essays, many, many, if not all of which had been published before, but were collected and presented here. I'm going to read, uh, uh, again, some, some selected excerpts. Uh, feel free, if you want to comment, to pop it into the chat or try to remember for when we next pause. Okay. Um, in this short excerpt as well, uh, we'll get a little snippet of Professor Berkowitz's biography, so we have a little bit of context for who he was and where he was functioning. For nearly two centuries, the institution of Jewish law has sustained withering criticism from religious thinkers who have argued that in submitting to a legalistic outlook, Judaism has abandoned the moral truths that were at the core of the ancient biblical teaching. Following Spinoza, 
These writers have argued that while the law may once have been necessary for the establishment of the ancient Jewish people, it was already showing signs of wear by the time of the prophets such as Isaiah and Jeremiah, and is certainly not relevant as law today. Rather, it is the moral spirit expressed, expressed by these prophets that is the eternal message of Judaism. Okay. Just skipping forward a little bit, views similar to Buber's can be said to have reached the height of their influence during the first half of the 20th century, at a time when modernist beliefs had become so accepted among Jewish religious thinkers that many openly doubted whether Jewish law would even survive the coming generations. In our day, however, a reaction against such extreme positions can be felt throughout the spectrum of Jewish belief. A striking example being the platform adopted by the reform movement in 1999, which broke with its century long opposition to the application of Jewish law, when it called for the ongoing study of the whole array of mitzvot and the renewed observance of classical practices previously abjured by many of the movement's leaders. As a result, the question of the importance of Jewish law or halakha has again become relevant in circles beyond its traditional constituency, necessitating the reconsideration of fundamental questions concerning the nature and function of this law. If an approach to Jewish life based on law is not inherently at odds with the moral demands of the prophets, as some have argued, then what, if anything, is its moral value? Is it possible that the law properly understood could itself play an important role in creating the moral personality and even that most elusive of aims, the moral society? Right? So kind of mapping out over centuries a certain sense over history in Jewish thought in the modern period, certainly of a move away from seeing halakha again in the broader Jewish community, we wouldn't say this in the Orthodox community, in the broader Jewish community, a sense of a halakha becoming, you know, archaic, ossified, and almost running counter to the creation of a moral society. But now we're living in a moment in which, you know, even, quote unquote, the reform movement is looking to redeem, in some sense, the halakha, bring it back, even if in a modified form, um, and seeing in it a true possibility for creating moral society or seeing it as having a central role in Jewish life. And if that's true, you know, in the reform movement, um, then it, it opens up a, a Jewish community wide question about the converse, mm -hmm. uh, conversation about the question of you know, if, if we if we believe, expect and demand a moral society, we see that as the prophetic message, very appropriate for this group as our Thursday morning class over years and years has been studying the prophets We just completed the book of Isaiah. Um, and we hear their their call to morality um, and sometimes a tension between moral law, ethical law and ritual law, which we'll see a lot more about in the coming minutes. Um, if, that's, if that is the, is the fundamental prophetic message, does the halakha continue to um, develop and express that moral message? Maybe there's some worry that it doesn't um, and, and what Jewish thinkers can help us understand and address that. So returning to, to the text, with such questions in the air, it's well worth a renewed consideration of the writings of Eliezer Berkowitz, perhaps the one modern thinker who addressed these questions most directly and systematically, and for who, and who for this reason may prove to be the most significant Jewish moral theorist of the last generation. So that's a great recommendation. If this question is of interest to you, can halakha be the tool, not that halakha should ever be viewed as a tool, but can halakha be the vehicle for the expression of and the building of a moral person and a moral society, um, if that's a question that interests you, then Professor Berkowitz is your modern thinker uh, for this question, uh, right? He, he's known principally for his writings on the Holocaust. His most important work, however, may be his exploration of the nature of Jewish morality, an effort spanning half a dozen books and many essays. This he achieved through a careful examination of the rabbinic and biblical literature. We're not gonna get a chance to really um, dig into that uh, today. Uh, we'll see only a, a very few um, set of excerpts from Jewish texts themselves and much more of a philosophical survey overview approach. But many of his essays on particular topics are replete with quotes from the Talmud uh, and beyond. So a careful examination of rabbinic and biblical literature which led him to reach three important conclusions about Jewish morality. One, that the halakha as presented in the Bible and Talmud is primarily about moral values rather than rules, and that any attempt to reduce it to a fixed set of rules violates its essence. That could sound like, that, that sounds great to us, but it may also sound surprising to us, right? If you, if you read 
the halacha and the Bible and the Talmud, it sounds more like, or it certainly seems to have been classically understood as it's come down to us as a set of rules. To understand it as a set of moral values um, is, I think, a different kind of approach. Again, it may very much resonate, um, but it, it, it may not feel like the, the way we've classically been taught or look at um, the Bible and the Talmud, primarily about moral values rather than rules. Two, that Jewish morality as expressed by the prophets and as impressed upon the halakha is concerned fundamentally with the consequences of one's actions rather than the quality of one's reasoning or intention. Um, Professor Chazoni, as he goes on in this introduction, we won't see that much of it, really goes to lengths to sort of demonstrate this point that so much of Jewish thought um, and philosophy of halakha has understood the kind of primary concern of halakha as kind of sort of almost the, the back end or the pre-end. What are we thinking about? What are our intentions um, in, you know, in performing mitzvot? Um, and here is maybe what we might call a, a, a teolo teleological approach, a question about the ends, the goals, the consequences, maybe a consequentialist approach. Um, what are the outcomes and how, how even would the intended or anticipated outcomes of mitzvot, how would they shape the way we interpret and frame those mitzvot. And three, that Judaism understands morality not only as a discipline of man's intellect or spirit, but no less as an effort which must be incorporated into the habits of his physical being through the vehicle of law, if it is to achieve its goal of advancing mankind in history. For me, this is one of the really novel uh, ideas of Professor Berkowitz, and uh, one that we I hope we'll get a chance to see short excerpt of him addressing directly, um, which is, but I'll front it here a little bit, which is his belief that the, the ritual mitzvot are not divorced from the ethical mitzvot. They, even if on the face of it, uh, keeping kosher um, or our, let's say, not say the institution of tefillah, but our current format of tefillah, which involves often wrote repetition on a daily basis of certain texts and, and even structured in such a way that makes it almost hard to maintain intentionality. Um, but those mitzvot, um, the donning of tefillin, uh, for those who don tefillin, which don't, they certainly have great ritual and spiritual power, but would we say that they have an ethical underpinning? That all of those things do have an ethical purpose and that purpose is very embodied talk about davening, tefillin, kashrut, these are very embodied activities, things we do with our bodies, um, and that they play a role, and this may be, feel surprising or maybe even insufficient, but I think it's really important to, to consider that they play a role in sort of training our bodies and our psyches with the tools and techniques that we need in order to be ethical beings. Certain sets of kind of um, willpower building, uh, capacity for focus training, um, things that we need in order to be uh, the highest order of ethical beings. So that while, while we, we might even have been able to suggest alternative practices to achieve the same um, ends, these practices which the Torah and halakha prescribe, both may have spiritual components and also have ethical purposes in training our body to be best fit um, to become maximally ethical beings. Okay, so I'm just going to read that, having tried to explain it a little bit. The Judaism understands morality not only as a discipline of man's intellect or spirit, but no less as an effort which must be incorporated into the habits of his physical being through the vehicle of law, if it is to achieve its goal of advancing mankind in history. Um, okay, we're gonna go to one, we'll go to a little, um, little biographical paragraph, a couple more um, short excerpts, and then we'll open up for some initial questions and comments. I know we're going quickly and it may it still feels a little bit uh, abstract. Eliezer Berkowitz was born in Romania in 1908 and received his rabbinical and philosophical training in the 1930s at the Hildesheimer Rabbinical Seminary in Berlin and the University of Berlin, meaning his, both his rabbinic ordination and his PhD, respectively. 
After escaping Germany in 1938, Berkowitz served as a communal rabbi in Leeds, Sydney, and Boston, about three continents, um, before assuming the chair of the philosophy department at the Hebrew Theological College in Chicago in 1958, where he taught until 1975. At that time, at the age of 67, Berkowitz relocated to Jerusalem, where he lived and worked until his death less than a decade ago. Again, that was in 2001. Over the course of his career, Berkowitz wrote no fewer than 19 books, as well as many articles, which, while demonstrating an unflagging devotion to Orthodox Judaism, nevertheless reflected a sharp discontent with the dramatic changes that Orthodoxy had undergone during his lifetime. Uh, here, Chazoni goes on to talk about, you know, the, the shift to a kind of overly textual tradition, um, a, uh, a, a diminishing of the priority of the ethical, um, what he calls here an ethos of chumra, a focus on kind of being strict in order to fulfill all the opinions as opposed to being open to choosing the opinion which feels most correct or resonant or oriented towards the goals of building an ethical society um, and that those things have all been to the, to the detriment of halakha. Uh, okay, I'm going to go forward to another excerpt. According to Berkowitz, the written Torah cannot and does not advertise itself as an exhaustive handbook of Jewish living. Rather, it, prevents, it presents laws together with moral values and then depends on an oral tradition to derive, express, and apply these principles to the realities of human life. The role of the scholar is to internalize these values and translate them into functional rabbinic precedent through what Berkowitz calls the creative boldness of application of the comprehensive ethos of the Torah to the case. Through a living oral tradition, the scholar of Torah gives the written law its applicability, makes it relevant for the life of his generation and thereby redeems it from irrelevance and inhumanness. The written law longs for this, its redemption by the oral Torah. So again, here we have a much more broad vision. Now, Professor Berkowitz, is, the, the way he did this himself did not result in radical change from the Orthodox community of his time. In other words, he did not, um, even as he addressed the, the question of the place of women in society and, and Jewish law and community, he did not uh, you know, advocate a full egalitarianism in his time, even though he saw, I think, that as an underlying ethos, but certainly more progress than the Orthodox community had made in its time. Um, he had some different approaches to uh, the question of resolving the Aguna issue, um, ones which I think are truly halachically grounded, but were thought as a little bit beyond the where the Orthodox rabbinic establishment was ready to go in its time. Um, so again, he was not a, he wasn't, he was perhaps uh, halachically, philosophically radical in a certain sense, but when it actually played out, it, it did not create absolute um, departure from the norms of the Orthodox community, but he was definitely perceived as a fringe um, within the Orthodox community for some of um, his philosophy and for some of the halachic conclusions that they brought him to. Um, and you can see here, again, a vision that I think we've moved away from in our current moment, but I think we are trying to move back towards at least in our segment of the Orthodox community, um, which is a sense of a more flexibility in the application of, again, here, remember, I'll pause again to say, he's not saying here the application of the ethos of our secular and philosophical culture to the Torah, but he's saying the comprehensive ethos of the Torah. So a broad view of Torah and Torah values to be applied to a case um, and uh, with boldness to come to uh, whatever conclusion um, those values might bring one to. I want to just pause here for one moment um, or interrupt for one moment uh, to note that uh, just yesterday um, I had participated in my once or twice a year uh, through the leadership of uh, Rav Yitz and Bishop Scharfenberger, modern Orthodox Jewish and Catholic Bishop um, interfaith dialogue group. Uh, and the topic yesterday was authority and change, um, completely appropriate for Professor Berkowitz. He indeed could have been the topic of our study on the Jewish side. Um, on the Catholic side, we got a chance to learn about a thinker uh, from the 19th century in England, um, called John Henry Newman, um, who 
uh, I really encourage your exploration of, I see Livia smiling, uh, she may know his writing, um, who really thought about these questions of, um, of how does law and theology change and had really, I think, a profound vision um, that I think is different from the way we currently think in the Orthodox community, essentially that change is an absolute necessity. The question is how to create balanced change that is considered genuine. He had what he called seven notes for genuine development of the tradition, sort of uh, factors and considerations that had to be taken into, into account. But what was very striking, he had, in, in, he had a kind of metaphor um, of a plant, right? If the plant is not watered, and, and water is something outside of the plant, it's external to the plant. But if the plant is not watered, it will die. If the plant is flooded with water, it will also not survive. The water in this sort of metaphor is kind of the, the forces of change. Sometimes it is even kind of ideas that are, that are beyond the system itself. Um, and that change is an absolute necessity to be authentic to the tradition is not to keep the tradition frozen. It's to continue to progress and develop the tradition, but in continuity with its, with its past and its precedents. And that resonated with me very much uh, as Professor Berkowitz's philosophy of halakha, that if halakha is not continually developing, if it looks the same in one generation as it did in the previous, then it's frozen and it's failing and it's sort of stuck in the written law and it is and it has not been redeemed by the oral law. Um, it needs that continual progress, even as that progress needs to be grounded in and uh, the Torah values and continuous and connected to the past, but must by necessity change. Okay, I'm zooming out again so that I can go to one more excerpt before I pause for questions and comments. Okay, coming back to the values and rules, point number one. Berkowitz's emphasis on values rather than rules and the kinds of change which such an approach implies earned him no small amount of criticism from an orthodox establishment that was and continues to be in the midst of a dramatic shift in the opposite direction, right? To move towards rules and not values. Yet his account of the oral tradition resolves a number of difficulties which the more conventional accounts are at pains to address. For example, a salient feature of the Talmud is its interweaving of legal discussions into a single text with the anecdotal and legendary materials known as Agadah. From the structure of the Talmud, it appears as though the Halakha and Agadah were originally studied together as a single subject. But if the Halakha is essentially a set of rules rather than values, there is no obvious reason why the Talmud or the, or the Torah for that matter should ever have mixed together to essentially unrelated literary forms, right? Why would you need to have stories and legends alongside law? Yet if, as Berkowitz insists, the rules of the halakha are merely one reflection of a set of higher moral principles, and the rules alone cannot suffice to provide the content of these values, then the interspersion of agadic material becomes reasonable, for it is in the tales and aphorisms of the rabbis that these moral principles are presented as part of an actual life full of unique situations. It's these stories that permit the student of halakha to study the application of values in complex living circumstances in a way that the study of a cut and dry legal code never can. And I love this just next little bit. If the institutions of Shabbat and prayer, to take two examples, are not merely about following a particular set of rules, but in fact aim at creating a certain type of devotional experience of which the rules are only a part, then the many agadot which appear in the Talmudic tractates of Shabbat and Brachot, and which are rich in theological statements about the nature of these institutions, constitute a crucial alternative path for understanding how to live them. In other words, from the, from the you know, settled law of Shabbat, we actually can't fully understand Shabbat. It's from the stories and the philosophical statements about Shabbat as well, um, which we need uh, in order to get a full grasp uh, of, of, of what the halakha should be uh, and in order to kind of distill the pr deeper principles and values which need to come into play in the continuing application of those values to every new moment, new because there's new technology or new because we're living in a new moment, um, we're experiencing them in a new way, 
um, which enables the, um, the halacha to continue to develop. Goes on to talk about uh, the relationship between prophetic and halachic texts and sort of the necessity of their being interwoven for the same reasons because the, the um, you know, principles and underlying values that are expressed in the prophets uh, are, are necessary to continue to develop the halakha. I'll just read this sentence. From the perspective suggested by Berkovitz, there is no necessary separation between prophetic and rabbinic Judaism, for the thrust of both is moral. Okay, one more little bit. On. Okay, actually, I'm going to, uh, the next section is where he talks about um, the idea of kind of the ethical, even within the ritual, uh, and I want to find that piece, hold on. There. Uh, one, one question. Yeah, hold on a second. Yeah. Just one more moment while we do this last little bit, then we'll be finished the introduction and I'll open it up. Here we go. Thus, for Berkowitz, and again, we'll see this in his own writing. Um, here we go. He talks about the metaphor, as we've touched lightly on, of kind of military training to explain why some of the ritual laws are necessary to train a person for an ethical. Um, life, here he says, thus for Berkowitz, even the ritual aspects of Jewish law, which are devoid of obvious moral worth, are nonetheless crucial for the moral training they provide. The dietary laws, for example, can be understood as preparation for a situation in which proper moral conduct may come into conflict with a specific physical urge, in this case, the appetite for food. Through the continual controlled inhibition of this appetite for the sake of a higher law, man learns to limit the influence of this urge upon his actions. When combined with similar training with regard to other physical inclinations, man's physical side as a whole becomes conditioned to responding correctly and accurately whenever emotions or inclinations conflict with moral demands. He quotes, the aim is to teach a new awareness, one which is foreign to the organic component of the human personality. This is part of his argument, again, sort of almost against uh, maybe a Christian belief and, to, and, and a, a prior um, Jewish belief that kind of the emphasis of the spirit over the body. Here he's talking about the absolute indispensability of the body and the sort of training of the body to become um, ethically excellent. The aim is to teach a new awareness, one which is far into the organic component of the human personality. It's the awareness of an order of being as well as meaning different from that of organic egocentricity. The purpose of the inhibitive rules is to practice saying no to self-centered demands, whereas the fulfillment of the positive commands is the exercise of saying yes in consideration of an order different from one's own. And here maybe overlaps with, I think, a broad you know, strand of Jewish philosophy and thought deeply grounded in the you know, prophets, the Bible, the prophets and the rabbis, um, which is the sense that part of the, of the ultimate development of the ethical self is the sense of responsibility and awareness primarily to the other. And so sort of training ourselves in inhibiting the self makes room for our being ready and able to um, accommodate and account for the other. That's sort of the lotases, the negative commands. And the ases, the sort of pushing ourselves to perform actions bodily or otherwise, which may be not in our nature, um, is the exercise of saying yes in consideration of an order different from one's own. I'll just uh, do one more little bit. This does not, of course, mean that the ritual laws have no meaning beyond their utility, right? It's not to say that the whole goal of kashrut or, you know, or tefillah is to train the body to be ethically ready for other um, circumstances or environments which may arise. And by the way, this is very illustrative of his overall 
philosophy, the idea of training for other circumstances which may arise is a way of, of signaling that the entirety of halacha, the, 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 the corpus of halacha does not address all circumstances and situations. Part of what it means to be Jewish and, and, and you know, embracing of, of, the, of, the, of the halacha kind of writ large is to be ready to encounter unknown circumstances, which you won't find the answer to in the Shulchan Aruch, uh, but about which um, Jewish values and ethics should inform a response. And to do so, we have to sort of train ourselves. Um, and so um, these ritual laws set us up for the things about which there isn't a written halacha, but we are preparing ourselves to encounter. All of that said, again, this does not, of course, mean that those ritual laws have no meaning beyond their utility. It's not just keeping kosher so that you train yourself to have willpower. Berkowitz is careful to avoid casting Jewish rituals solely in an instrumental light at the expense of the symbolic, devotional, or historical meaning the rituals entail. Um, and he just addresses that more uh, elsewhere. Okay, I'm almost ready to take questions or comments. Um, in fact, I think I'm ready just about. Um, we'll just do this last little bit of the intro. The Jewish moral tradition brings together three distinct elements, a system of law incorporating both moral and ritual obligations, a set of moral values emphasized in the teaching of the prophets and in the rabbinic tradition, and a vision of the improvement of man's lot in history, which adherence to the Jewish normative system is meant to assist in bringing about. Okay, so we've got our, our halakha as it is, our system of law, we have our moral values, and we have our big picture, almost messianic mission and goal, the improvement of man's lot in history. I love this point. Because of the difficulty of maintaining a balance among all three elements, law, values, and vision, contemporary Jewish thinkers are often found attempting to escape the central role bequeathed to one or another of them by Jewish tradition. For some traditional values such as kavod habriot, human dignity, are downplayed in the effort to transform the more concrete precepts of Jewish law into the central imperative of religion. Among others, it's the law that is undermined in the pursuit of distilled moral values, which possessing great appeal in their simplest form frequently fall short in their ability to give clear guidance for moral action when confronted with the complexity of real life. And in many cases as well, the improvement of man's condition within history is relegated to the status of a wishful mystical outcome resulting from one's devotion to either laws or ethical principles that are themselves derived without reference to their consequences in history, and so no longer seem to have any discernible purpose that reaches beyond the bounds of the subjective mind. Of Jewish thinkers in the last century, it was Eliezer Berkowitz who most successfully combined these diverse elements of the tradition, preserving for each a proper place within a balanced system of Jewish morality. For Berkowitz, it's the values of Judaism which constitute its eternal moral fabric, which underlie the law and which dictate the extent of change in the law over time. It's the prophetic vision which establishes morality as a vehicle for the advancement of man and thereby determines the consequentialist character of these values. And it is the law as law, meaning binding force, not merely as traditional practice, which is needed to address the fundamental problem of man's corporeality, of our embodiedness a problem that must be overcome if moral beliefs are to be translated reliably into moral outcomes. Taken together, these elements form a comprehensive approach to morality, which seems to offer the possibility of a Judaism that is capable of holding fast before the tides of revolution, while at the same time safeguarding our humanity and offering us the hope of genuine improvement of our condition within history. So I think that's a really great summation. Law, values, and vision Often uh, Jewish philosophers or thinkers will prioritize one or two at the expense of a third. And in Chazoni's reading, uh, and I'm compelled by this, Professor Berkowitz in his writing and thinking really um, attempts to find a way to center all three of them and to understand them as um, cooperative in, in an overall vision. Okay, um, as we normally do on Thursdays, um, we just ask people who want to uh, comment to raise their hand, say their name or put their name in the chat. We'll make a little speakers list, hear from everybody, and then we'll try to um, still see two excerpts of Professor Berkowitz's writing himself. So I see Estelle, I see Dad. Hold on. 
I'm going to write down the names of those who want to share. Any other hands for the moment? I see Bev, I see Graham. Great, I'm gonna encourage folks, again, a little bit differently than usual, um, to try to be concise in your questions or comments so we have a chance to, uh, to hear from everybody and go forward. Estelle, go ahead. Um, it, it's just very short. From, from what you read, I realized that um, uh, Professor Berkowitz is, feeling, is, is bringing religion up to date as much as possible. And, and I was just asking how many in the Orthodox community or the rabbinic Orthodox community uh, would, would think of bringing religion up to date, which would certainly um, probably uh, include conservative, the conservatives and the, and the, and the uh, reform, because if it were brought up to date, then it would include everybody like this, because they don't bring it up to date, there are these three factions and 27 other different factions. Hmm. So I, I'm just questioning that. Yeah. It's a great question and comment and um, uh, question better than the answer. I don't think I can answer the question of how many people are thinking that way and what would a fully up-to-date uh, version um, look like. Although again, I wanna, I wanna note that in, in, in using that language of up-to-date to the extent to which we imply by that an incorporation of the current philosophical and ethical values of our, the cultures in which we live as applied to the Torah. I don't think Professor Berkowitz would articulate it exactly the same way. I think he would say um, it's only the Torah values. And indeed many Torah values run counter to, I think some of the, I don't know if I want to call them the ethics, but certainly the, the uh, um, lived cultural, socio-cultural life of our age in America today. So I don't know if he would, if he would agree with up to date in the sense of up to date of 21st century American vision and values, but I think he would say up to date in the sense of giving full voice to all the values within our tradition. Now, maybe some of the values within our tradition were silenced because of the prevailing cultures in which people lived. And I think that's really an interesting question. And I wish we could ask him more about how he sees you know, Jewish values in dialogue with you know, the values of the culture in which we live. Well, just incorporating women, more, more women in, in, their, in their function. Correct. In the Correct. And I think the critical question that I would wanna ask him is, is the reconsideration of the place of women in Judaism um, to what extent is that influenced by the egalitarianism of the modern age? And to what extent is that simply saying, no, look in the Torah. God created, you know, man and woman. Egalitarianism is, you know, shot through our sacred texts. And we're just giving that a voice again. And because somehow, you know, we ran aground of the Torah's eternal values. Um, you know, or would he say, well, no, of course, I acknowledge a debt to the societies in which we live, the, the Western values that have lifted up egalitarianism and allowed us to see that in the Torah. Uh, maybe he would say no. Again, maybe he would say that was always in the Torah and it was the, it was the intrusion of other cultures um, that sort of uh, you know, took it away. I think it's, it's hard to disentangle those threads, but it's important to ask that question. So thank you. Um, Dad, go ahead. Um, just two observations. One uh, from from the life of the Rav, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, uh, using Shabbos as an example. He he learned the halacha of Shabbos from his father, but he learned the love and the feelings of Shabbos from his mother. So I mean, this is not a question of law and morality, but it's it's I think combining halacha and agada in in his life. Yes. And the other, the other observation, I always wondered why Professor Berkowitz was on the faculty of the Hebrew Theological College in Skokie. What, what about that institution was, was so welcoming to him and his ideas? And, and just for example, and not Yeshiva University's right. uh, rabbinical seminary. 
So I, I don't know if you have any Please. thoughts on that. Great, great, thank you. Um, I wish I knew more about his life and times and kind of how he was received and welcomed in different segments of the Orthodox community to answer that question. There certainly are contemporary people. Um, and honestly, I think Professor Steve Bain might be one of them who could answer that question. If I can get a little more insight onto it um, for before next class, even though it'll be a, a postscript, um, I'll try to find out more about that because I'm also very curious about, again, um, I think maybe Professor Alan Brill also uh, would have insight onto that question. I'm sure there are others. Um, yes, and I, I liked your, you know, description of, by comparison to Rav Soloveitchik and the different the different inputs that form a more comprehensive view of Jewish life and practice. Um, uh, I couldn't find it in a quick skim, but Professor Chazoni kind of sets up just as an aside. Um, Professor Berkovitz as indeed fairly different from Rav Soloveitchik in philosophy of halacha in certain ways. Uh, if I'm understanding correctly, Rav Soloveitchik had more of a Kantian point of view and uh, Professor Berkowitz really went against a sort of Kantian philosophical input into halachic thinking, but now I'm a little beyond my, uh, my comfort zone. So just to share that for those for whom it resonates or makes sense, great. That's uh, just a little bit of what I, what I read. Um, Bev, go ahead. See if you can unmute. Yes. Uh, uh, Professor Berkowitz was part of the reform movement, as I understand it. Is that correct? Professor Berkowitz was in the Orthodox community. He was in the Orthodox. Yes. He yes. was not accepted. He was not widely accepted in the Orthodox community. But again, as my father pointed out, Hebrew Theological College was a part of the Orthodox community. He's always functioned inside of, although I think we could say on the uh, over time, increasingly on the margins of the Orthodox community. But I don't think he would ever have identified himself in, nor do I think he would ever be claimed by any other movement of Judaism. Okay, that's what I wanted to clarify, because I think that the reform movement adopted his ideas um, more uh, rapidly than the Orthodox community. And so, and so they didn't embrace or he didn't embrace them and they didn't embrace him but they did they did what he said <laughs> you know and that's um and that is um you know sometimes you don't have to really identify uh with something to be uh to be part of it you don't have to uh, acknowledge that you have identified so it, it applies even today to people who won't register Democrat, but will vote Democrat. Mm. You know, they won't identify, but um, they choose to uh, um, be an independent, but vote Democrat. Here he is uh, doing what they want uh, and, and have adopted, but without, without identifying. Now, I, I wonder why he didn't, uh, you know, why he, he, he didn't identify with the reform movement. Maybe it's over a period of time and so on. Maybe time played a, a role in it. But I, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, Bev, that he, you know, while, while I actually agree with you that arguably his philosophy of halakha could map onto Orthodox, conservative, and reform kind of vision to, to a degree where I think there is, at least maybe I would differentiate from the reform movement, is I think that the reform movement, I'm not a scholar of denominations, truly doesn't see halakha as formally binding. I think they see it as the accumulated wisdom of our generations and a deep part of our history and something which we should selectively incorporate into our life and practice, but not as something fundamentally obligatory. I think the conservative and orthodox denominations see halakha as fundamentally obligatory. And Professor Berkowitz, while he was continually advocating for the development and the progress and the evolution of halakha, I don't think he would ever have said that the halakha is not absolutely binding. In fact, I think he saw that 
the role of obligation as essential in developing an ethical, an ethical self. Um, and that once you shed the sense of, of commandedness, um, then you lose so much of the power of this system for developing an ethical personality because it then just simply becomes a system of autonomy and choice. Um, and and that, that's, that weakens an ethical imperative in many ways. We can also say that the, you know, the ossification of halakha to a degree has also weakened the, the ethical imperative. Right. Right. That he's still coming from the side of seeing obligation as absolutely um, necessary in the system. Um, and um, I can't remember what else I was going to say other than, they, then again, and, and that was reflected in his personal practice, which was punctilious in all, in all aspects of observance, as far as I understand. Um, uh, I'm going to call on Graham and also just note as, uh, since we won't have time to uh, comment on all of it, thanks to all those who shared in the, um, in the chat, especially Lance for deeper, deeper insights mm -hmm. and points on a number of the figures that we've mentioned. And also want to acknowledge what Miriam shared about uh, your parents having the privilege of living in the same building as, uh, as Rabbi Dr. Berkowitz. That must, must have been amazing. And I hope you had a chance to hear stories about him uh, from them. Graham, go ahead. Okay, so um, in trying to understand this, um, up front, I'm, I'm hearing Berkowitz saying that if the law doesn't change, the people will be frozen and failing. So the purpose of the Jewish law seems to be to transform those who follow it and, and not just to keep people in line. Um, um, so if the law doesn't change, I think he's saying the times, um, if the law does not change with the times, it will not move the people. And um, so day-to-day -day behaviors need to be determined by the application of general rules, not rigid rules if I'm understanding it at all. And um, the people will not be transformed by the law if they can't identify with it. Um, the moral ideal has to be close enough to identify with, mm -hmm. but far away enough to be striven for or aspired to. That's where you get your, your evolutionary movement. Yes, yeah. Beautiful. I think you have you have absolutely understood. And in light of what you said, I also want to briefly mention one um, excerpt, which I didn't get a chance to share from the introduction, um, uh, which is I'll just read it without sharing the screen. Um, uh, one of Berkowitz's goals in writing Not in Heaven, that's the book I referenced at the beginning that was very impactful on me, um, is to demonstrate that the halakha not only accepts the priority of the moral, <laughs> but also as a consequence, constantly concerns itself with what he calls the wisdom of the feasible, the willingness to accept change in the legal order when this is necessary in order to avert undesirable social consequences, such as shame, injustice, waste, physical danger, or communal strife. Citing the Talmudic dictum, what is possible is possible, what is impossible is impossible, Berkowitz brings a number of cases in which the Jewish norm is determined not according to a strict application of abstract principle, but according to the possible, that which can be reasonably expected to bear successful application as measured by its consequences. So again, it's not exactly that the law bends to the people per se, but that the law absolutely incorporates, you know, what is possible. Um, he, I definitely remember, you know, the way he lifts up um, a, Talmud, a Talmudic idea of, you know, Ein gozrin eno yachol ba. We, and this is for rabbinic law. Um, we cannot, the rabbis cannot enact a decree that the majority of the community cannot um, tolerate or withstand. Now, tolerate doesn't mean they'll rise up against it in opposition. It means, you know, that's not feasibly incorporatable into their lives. Now, we could, we could look at that and then say, well, gosh, then we should abolish a whole bunch of laws because most of the Jewish community is not observing most of the laws. I think he would not say that, um, but he would say, because I, I think he would believe that a system of halacha is eminently livable. People are making choices for any of a variety of reasons not to live it, um, but that that's not because halacha is impossible or unreasonable to observe but because people under the influence of a variety of other factors and values may be choosing not to observe it. Still, that said, 
things that might seem to emerge from a halachic imperative, which truly are understood to be impossible to observe, um, you know, must, must not be obligatory and somehow must have to be revisited in some way. Okay, we're at 11.04. I'm gonna ask those, those who need to go, of course, please don't hesitate to sign off. I'll ask your indulgence for about five more minutes for those who can stay, just because I want us to have a chance to see a couple of quick excerpts of Professor Berkowitz's words themselves. So uh, we're gonna do that here. Um, again, this is from the essay, Law and Morality in Jewish Tradition. I'm gonna point to one of the kind of grounding points for him and then two little sort of applications or expansions. I, I wanted to look at this one because it's one place where we actually see excerpts from Jewish texts, uh, from the Talmud and from um, the scripture itself from the prophets, prophet Yirmiyahu. So he quotes this passage from the Talmud is towards the very beginning where it's on page four of this essay. Uh, in the Bible it's written, you shall walk after the eternal your God, but is it possible for man to walk after the presence of God? Isn't it written that the eternal your God is a devouring fire? Rather, the meaning is follow God by imitating God's dispositions. As God clothes the naked, so should you clothe the naked. As God visits the sick, so should you visit the sick. We've probably studied this passage on a few occasions. It's a favorite. Um, and it is the development of the idea of imitatio dei, right? The dispositions are, of course, the relational attributes. Their ultimate significance is that they provide the original pattern for all relationship on earth, right? So God's dispositions, God's midot, God's way of being, um, are relational things. Long before the Talmud and Plato, the idea found its classical expression in the words of the prophet Jeremiah when he proclaimed, thus says the eternal, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, nor let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glories glory in this, haskel v'yadoa oti, that he understands and knows me, that I am the eternal who exercises mercy, justice, and righteousness on earth, ki be'ele chafatzdi ne'um Hashem, for in these things I delight, says the eternal. And I never really focused on that um, language, but Professor Berkowitz does in this next paragraph. The knowledge of God surpasses all other possessions. Significantly, the prophet does not imply by it metaphysical meditation on the divine essence, right? What is knowledge of God? It's not the Maimonidean idea of contemplating God. Rather, God may only be known by God's relational attributes by the nature of God's involvement in creation, by the fact that God exercises mercy, justice, and righteousness on earth. Most important, however, is the concluding phrase, for in these things I delight, says the eternal, that God relates to the world because God delights in these things, establishes the imitatio dei as the divine law for man. Because these things are desired by God, the relational attributes become the example to follow. The encounter reveals not only God's concern, but also what God desires of man. So I, I just love that, pulling out that last little bit, the kiba ela in these things I delight as sort of almost the prophetic source for the idea that that's the focal point of what Jewish law is supposed to be um, and what it is that God wants from us. Okay, jumping ahead a bunch of pages. Here is just a little excerpt on the um, idea of the uh, role of the ritual meets vote in building up an ethical persona. Again, we already saw Professor Chazoni's kind of uh, summary of this, but we'll see just a bit of it on, on, in Professor Berkowitz's own words. The educational significance of the inhibitive, right, the thou shalt not, as well as positively enjoining thou shalt ritual laws, is that they represent the indirect attack of Jewish intention on the essential self-centeredness of the biophysical element, the unwilling yet indispensable partner in the ethical life, right? We, have, we live in, a, in an embodied world. We have our bodies. We're not just gonna transcend our bodies, right? Which is sort of the approach of other religions or even other streams within Judaism that we have the spirit and the flesh and the spirit needs to overcome um, and transcend the flesh. Here, we're really talking about halakha as something which trains the body to ethical excellence, not kind of the subjugates or attempts to overcome it, but trains it. Both the inhibitive um, and the prescriptive regulations of this code from the point of view of ethical training follow the indirect method. By referring to them as ritual laws, we express the idea that there's no logical reason for there being laws at all, right? Ritual, it's the practices that you do. There is, for instance, nothing in the real situation of man to suggest that it's harmful to partake of food that is forbidden by the dietary laws. What's wrong with eating non-kosher food? It is the law itself that creates an artificial situation, as it were, 
It orders people to behave as if it mattered what type of food they consumed. Or let us take another example, one which is not inhibitive, but prescribes some form of action, the commandment of the daily wearing of phylacteries. Again, there seems to be nothing in the real situation of man to require such an exercise, putting on tefillin. It's the law itself which creates a situation in which the performance of this religious duty is treated as seriously as if something important depended on it. It's the typical as if training situation. Judged by the reality of the immediate situation, the soldier engaged in camouflage exercises, his helmet adorned with branches and leaves, not daring to move lest an enemy take a shot at him, when obviously there is no enemy, does a silly thing. Seemingly, he's engaged in an equally absurd task when he aims his rifle loaded with make-believe bullets at a make-believe target. Yet on such make-believe may indeed depend his very life, should the as-if situation ever turn into a real conflict. And again, of course, he acknowledges that there are other values to these laws, but part of it is that we can't wait till the moment when we're called upon in a new ethical situation to suddenly develop the capacity to exercise willpower or to defend the other or to see the need of the other. We, and we also can't just learn that by reading lots and lots of books and prophetic texts about why it's important. We have to train our bodies to do so. Um, and that's part of what the ritual laws uh, do for us. One last excerpt, and then we'll conclude. Okay, this is just a little bit of a summary. Our discussion of the meaning of law within Judaism ought to be summed up at this point. Again, there's vast segments of this essay that we haven't seen at all. Uh, a lot of them were touched on by Professor Fazzoni. Um, you know, again, the kind of uh, law values and vision, three pieces and how they all go together. And a lot of it involves uh, Professor Berkowitz is engaging other philosophers, Jewish and non-Jewish alike, alike, and kind of classic problems around the quest questions of law and values um, and incorporating his point of view. Um, so here is really his, his summary. Our discussion of the meaning of the law of law within Judaism ought to be summed up at this point. We may say now that the division of the laws of Judaism into rational or ethical laws and religious or ritual observances is not quite justified and taken at face value may be misleading. We have seen that even the so-called rational laws concerning human conduct towards one's fellow cannot derive their obligatory quality from reason, right? This is one of the earlier points that he makes in the essay around this sort of question of, you know, um, uh, are they ethical because God commanded them or did God command them because they're ethical? He sort of somehow attempts to say both. They're ethical on their own terms. There is an innate ethics, but part of what helps us understand that and stick with it is the fact that God commands them. That's again, coming back to the essential need for obligatory quality. It is always a desire and a will that make law obligatory. The meaning of the revealed law in Judaism is that the law's obligatory nature derives from the expressed will of God. This, of course, means that all rational laws are also religious at the same time. On the other hand, what appears to be purely religious observance has its ethical relevance through its indirect education of the material element in man. A system of law that teaches man to say a limited no to the promptings of his own nature. Again, only a limited no, right? It's not about asceticism or self-negation as well as to the dictatorship of social custom, and that at the same time develops within him an inclination to say yes to the commands of an authority which is not of this world, helps man to establish his independence in facing the world. However, the most important function of the ritual laws is the orientation to the divine which they achieve for the physical being of man. The commands of action, it's about masiot, make it possible for the material element to enter into the relationship, right? So this is the other dimension Putting on tefillin doesn't just sort of train you into uh, doing things, you know, uh, and, and uh, kind of a training of, of the body to commitment to ongoing actions and practices that aren't, you know, obvious in their purpose, but they also create a relationship with God. From an awareness of an other, which is ethics, we proceed to the awareness of the holy other, which is religion. It is on the level of religion that one may hope to overcome the dualism of human nature. Within ethics, the sensuous, impulsive nature of man has to surrender to the ethical command, which is far into it. On the religious level, too, at first, the awareness of the other, who is God, requires submission to the will of God. However, on the religious level, the surrender to the will of God is the first phase of reconciliation and harmonization. Only here when the spirit need not deny the body, and the body need not feel shame in the presence of the spirit, right, as opposed to a spirit transcending body, 
Here we're talking about a creation of harmonization. May we find the culmination of all religious aspiration, the sanctity of life. I do not mean to suggest that these various functions of the law are ever fully realized in the life of man, but they do reflect the direction which the Jewish way of life pursues, <coughs> the goal at which it aims. According to rabbinical teaching, the Torah has been given in order to purify mankind. When the task of purification is completed, the law will be fulfilled, right? This is a recognition that we're always in progress and in process. In that state, to exercise mercy, justice, and righteousness on earth will have become the natural desire of the whole man. Here we can sort of see a little bit of the coming together of the law, values, and now the big kind of vision or mission. When as a result of the sanctifying deed, mankind as a whole will delight in these things, going back to that idea of God's delighting in these ethical mandates. And when that happens through the law, the law will no longer be needed. That's a kind of a radical little point to drop in at the end. But there are no shortcuts in history. Only through the law will the law be overcome. When that phase is reached, mankind will have fulfilled its destiny and history will be at an end. Right? I think it just, I mean, it's a huge point to consider. But in some sense, he's saying something which I've always thought about, which is what if we, you know, succeed in producing uh, a humanity which is thoroughly moral and ethical? You know, will Will tefillin still be required? Will kashrut still be required? And in some sense, he's arguing no. Um, but he's also arguing, don't think we're anywhere near there. Don't, don't get too excited or carried away. Um, there will be an ultimate vision at which point. And, and maybe he's, he's also saying, well, yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, any last quick questions, comments, or thoughts? You know, again, threw a lot at you, hopefully inspired you to want to read and learn more of his writings. There are many shorter essays, longer books, um, and lots to access. Uh, so um, any last questions or comments before we say goodbye for now? Modern orthodoxy, is that it? What's that, Estelle? I said modern orthodoxy or open orthodoxy. That's what he's espousing, so it seems. We are aiming and hoping to achieve that vision in some small way. Uh, Miriam, welcome. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi. Actually, it's Anna Poshis. Oh, Hi. <laughs> no, that's my mom's computer. Yes, Anna. Great, great to see you. Um, yeah, I was just thinking: is does that um, goal line up with the halachic or the the Judaic um, idea of Mashiach, of the age of Mashiach as being reaching that goal and a goal to go for? Absolutely, so. absolutely. And I, I, I think, I think so. Now, I think you'll you'll see that there. Um, there are various um, visions of a messianic age and, you know, and, and different takes on what it actually will look like. But I think he is in that sense, describing a messianic age um, in, uh, you know, in that last little bit um, and a sense that at that, at that point, um, you know, certain things will fall away. And we have, we have Talmudic um, ideas, Talmudic statements to that effect that, you know, all the holidays will be abolished in the time of the Mashiach, maybe, maybe except for Purim, there are various statements, but we have kind of hintings. It's not his own novel idea, and it's not, you know, it's, it's a prophetic idea in many ways, but there are hints to it in rabbinic literature as well. Yeah, great, great. All right, thank you, everybody. Wonderful to learn together. Thank, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, thank you. My voice all the way through, and uh, be in touch with me or Shuli if you'd like a copy of the, the packet as well to continue reading. Yes. And I hope you're able to join next uh, next Thursday for something uh, different and companion from uh, Dr. Roni Irshai. Thank you, Steve. Thank, thank, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi. Bye. Bye. Bye.